Welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. I'm Raf Giallo alongside Jim McMahon of RT Sport Online this week. And we've also got former Ireland international Keith Tracy. And we've also got coach and analyst Lisa Fallon. We've got plenty to talk about this week between the Ireland women's team who are going to be playing in Georgia on Monday and hoping to take a big step in the qualification for the World Cup. And also we'll be chatting League of Ireland, among other things. But Jim, I know you're always quite good with dates and anniversaries. Oh, yeah. So uh, you were telling me, just beforehand that uh this it's not quite a 30th or 40th but it's no. uh it's a uh, it's a fairly big anniversary in the world of football anyway yeah uh, <clears throat> this day 36 years ago someday the 22nd of june 1986 we had the hand of god at that diego aramanda maradona waltzed through the english defense and scored that goal and so it's hard to believe that it's 36 years and of course, the man that was doing the commentary for RT Television, he's now in the he's now in the broadcasting booth in the sky, Jimmy McGee. Only he summed it up by saying two words: "Different class." And I was just thinking there, and I'm, I'm not having a go at present day commentators, but if there's the likelihood that if somebody was commentating, uh, some other commentator in the world was commentating on that goal today, they would probably have used more words. Sometimes, as they say, less is more. And I always thought, Jimmy, by saying different class twice and then the second time putting great emphasis on it, certainly added to that moment in what was um, an average enough World Cup. I mean, I think it was a World Cup do- dominated by Diego Maradona, but certainly that that quarterfinal, certainly that was the standout uh, moment. I, I, I remember that there was a neighbour of, of mine at home, I think ITV, I don't think the game was on ITV, the game was on BBC and RT, and he didn't want to watch the football, he wanted to watch Jaws 2 that was on ITV at the same time as as that match, but that's what I remember about, and the following day, just as, just as a final aside, Barry, um, the boxer from the Sonus Clikes, uh, Barry McGuigan. Yeah, Barry McGuigan. Sorry there. Thanks, Lisa. He lost his fight in Las Vegas the following day. And that was that was the end of his, that was the end of him as world champion. So that's what happened. It's hard to believe. It was 36 years ago. I was just out of nappies, but I still remember it. So that's it. Uh Jaws 2. I don't I've seen I've seen Jaws 1, but uh Jaws 2 is Jaws that like two. is that the shark's Jaws brother two. or something that comes back for revenge? Uh, no, Jaws 2 is not, certainly not as good as Jaws 1. No, Jaws 2, there's a shark in the water and it's more or less the same as Jaws 1, but just not as good. I mean, Spielberg didn't direct it. So, and at the end, I think the shark gets electrocuted. I think Chief Brody electrocutes the shark at the end of it. Anyways, but anyways, we're digressing too much now. Yeah, that's, there's a bit of a spoiler alert in there. <laughs> we'll get ourselves back onto footballing ground now. Yeah. Um, obviously, look, um, you were telling me as well, you're going to be on game game on on 2FM uh, tonight you're kind of previewing the summer of sport and yeah. from a soccer point of view there's only one show in town really yeah that's right this day fortnight we have the start of the women's euros in England uh, England hosting it and all games are going to be on RT television for the first time so running from the 6th to the 31st of July um, I'm sure 16 teams in at this probably Lisa would you say maybe six Six to six, seven teams are more than capable of being the winners at the end of it all. Yeah, I think it's going to be a really interesting tournament, and and that's that's the thing about the women's tournaments that, that you're going into them now, and there's more teams that can cause upsets. And you know, you look at Canada, what they by going and winning the Olympic gold last year, like they beat the USA and Sweden en route to doing that, and nobody foresaw it. Um, and and what Beth Priestman did was well, she she just got the, the the absolute maximum out of her squad, and it was it was so interesting. Um, but I think you know the fact that it's being held in England makes it so accessible to people. Um, I think the fact that Northern Ireland have qualified obviously makes it um, you know a little bit gut wrenching from mm-hmm. our perspective. But you know it'll be great to see how Kenny Shields and the girls get on. Um, England are going to probably carry the burden of 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 pressure that they've never really carried before similar to what the men experience in competitions but like you look at the likes of Sweden Germany uh, Netherlands there are some really t- and, and Norway have Ada Hegerberg back as well I saw her I was over at the Women's Champions League final there a few weeks ago um, and she is 
it was the first time I've seen her play live and I'm because she's she's had that ACL injury and she's back now. But what an influence she has on the team. She is a serious um, fulcrum around which the team is built and she influences so much from the forward position. And I think there's something about Norway as well. I think they'll be really, really interested in this tournament. So I think it's going to be a fascinating tournament um, and I think it's going to be really, really competitive and, and I'm really looking forward to it. And hopefully yeah. there'll be decent crowds there as well, Lisa. Just finally on it, Lisa, I know we're not there, but if we were there, where would you put us currently? I know it's a difficult question to ask, but where would you put us in the pecking, say, of, of the 16 teams? Or where would, we, where would we be likely to, you know, could you see us getting to the quarter? You know, or, 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 I know it's a difficult... It, it is. Well, I suppose if you think on, if you, if you look at the, if you put it into a little bit of context and said, say, for example, that Ireland, that Northern Ireland qualified by beating Ukraine in the playoffs and Ukraine were in Ireland's group. And it was as a result of Ireland not beating Ukraine that we, we didn't get out of the group. I think if you look at the group that Northern Ireland are in, it's a really difficult group. It, it, it's a really, really tough group. Um, I think they've got Austria, England and Norway. So it's a very tough group. Um, would I see Northern Ireland coming out of that group? Possibly not. Um, like I said, based on the quality that, that's in it. But um, it's um, it, the whole thing about tournaments and bearing in mind that Ireland have never qualified for one of the women's team have never qualified for a major tournament. So you need to get there to one. I remember when Northern Ireland men's team qualified in 2016, it was the first time that they got to the Euros. And it's just that whole experience of, of having a, a tournament experience. And it's so important because nothing can really prepare for you until you go through it. Um, and then it's that experience that you take into the next tournament. But, um, but look, um, I think, like I said, it's going to be a competitive tournament. Ireland are not there. So, you know, the big game coming up next week to try and get to a different tournament. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that needs to be all the focus now because I think... You know, they're in as good a position as they'll ever be. Um, and when we talk about Ireland, we'll talk about World Cup qualification and, um, you know, we'll enjoy the Euros for what it is. But I, I still think the Euros being in England and the fact that they're being broadcast on RTE will have a massive, massive impact on the women's game here. Just the visibility piece. Um, and I think, you know, even just for people to see the women's game now, because people are always talking about the growth of the women's game. But now I think the women's game is starting to stand on its own two feet. A lot of the, a lot of the grounds are sold out um, for, mm. for this tournament. Um, and, and, you know, you just have to look at the, the crowds of Barcelona and clubs across Europe, 91,000 people at a game. Um, so, you know, the game is changing. and uh, Women's football is starting to stand on its own two feet and, and establish its own identity. Um, and that's a really positive thing. And I think the, the Euros now uh, and the, the fact that they're being broadcast all over the world um, is going to be a, a massive game changer. Okay. Yeah. And as you said, live on RTE across the summer as well, which will, as you said, uh, will show a lot of visibility for the game. Um, we'll be talking about the Ireland women's team very, very shortly, but we're going to go through a few different news stories first. And uh, the Ireland under 21s have been drawn against Israel in the playoff in September, which is taking place on the 19th and the 27th, the home game first, and then away afterwards. Um, Lisa, you were saying off air that, you know, it's a very tough draw. This uh, Israel, obviously, second to Germany in Group B in the qualifiers and having pipped Poland as well and that they're going to be and they've qualified twice for this tournament previously so it's a it's a daunting enough task yeah it is and and look um I think I saw a comment that Jim Crawford said that at, at the at the at the at the draw everybody wanted to be drawn against Ireland so uh, and he said that they would use that as as a massive incentive and it's a great incentive for the lads look they i think even if you look at the team over the course of this campaign from where they were in the early rounds um, particularly in the games against Montenegro and Bosnia, there was a real maturity I've seen develop in the team, cohesion, a bit of alignment, you know, um, and obviously the fact that Will Smallbone's back in, he's made a huge impact since he's come back from his own injury issues. Um, and there's a lot of depth and belief in the squad. And like I said, they know each other now and you can see there's a bit of a rhythm to them. I know the Italy game was, was a difficult one um, and, 
you know, you, you, you are talking about a team with a step up in class, but Ireland did get really good results against Sweden. Um, and, and like I said, the team has grown. So, you know, there'll be more time for Jim to, to do a little bit of work and they'll have everything prepared. But like the playoffs are, you know, two games, you get it right in those two games and you'll go through and it doesn't matter who the opposition are. That's why we love football, because the underdog always has a chance. And, um, you know, and the lads will have belief and there's a lot of talent in that team um, and the pressure will be on Israel, obviously, to qualify. So, yes, it'll be a tough game, but I think if they get their bits and pieces right and, and the preparations right and that they have everybody available, um, that they have the best players available to them I think they've a right chance but it will be it will be difficult and Keith you know the whole you know playing the first leg at home and then going away in the second you know there's always I think we always assume that the uh that the advantage generally is if you're you play it away first and then um you bring the opposition back home um do you, would you read too much into that in this kind of modern day and age or do you feel that is a little disadvantage no personally I, I don't think it matters I don't think the players will be too uh will be too bothered about where they're, where they're playing first and where they're playing second I think it, it, I think we just need to try and do a job on them. They're obviously an extremely talented bunch of lads, which we obviously have a talented bunch of lads because I, I played in an under-21 team under Don Gibbons that was very, very talented and we didn't reach the, this uh, where they are now into a playoff. We, we fell way short and Ireland teams generally do under-21. So it, it's an achievement to get where they got, especially when you're thinking that the senior team has a good couple of under-21s that could drop back down and play in the under-21 squad. So... We're in a good place at the minute, but you know, I think we have we've took the a lot of strength out of twenty ones and brought them through to the senior team. So I don't know whether that could play a factor in in the final standings against Israel. But look, I like it. I, I love I love playing for Ireland under twenty ones. The spirit of when when we meet up together and we, we were always underdogs, but we always put a good a good account of ourselves. We always fought to and nail for everything. So listen, if Ireland torn up with the spirit that he did in the last couple of games, there's every chance. That he could uh, that he could get some sort of result here and get through, which is obviously what we all want. Yeah, you mentioned players who would normally be eligible for the twenty ones. One of them being Gavin Bazunu, but of course, I think he, that ship has sailed, and he's very much an established senior international. And not just that, now he's going to be a Premier League goalkeeper. So he's obviously, as people will know, signed a five year deal with Southampton. Um, Keith, I suppose as a club, and we've seen Southampton, particularly with outfielders, you know, young players have got a lot of opportunities there. It's almost the perfect club for him to take that next step in his career. I would think so, yeah. He's only 20 years of age, obviously uh, cut his teeth with Manchester City. He was at Portsmouth last year. Played uh, played just, I think it was 44 games in the Championship last season. And uh, it's not the Championship, sorry, at Portsmouth. 16 clean sheets, which is really good. But the, when you think of Gavin Bazzuni, you think he can play football as well. I've heard Ralph Hassan Hill speak about him, that he can play out from the back. He can start the tack. So... When we think of goalkeepers, very rarely now do we talk about shot stopping and coming out by corners and stuff like that, which is Gavin is very, very good at. He's a big, strong boy. He can do them things. But he can play out from the back as well. But the, the thing I like about Southampton is when you throw your mind back to last year when he got beat 9-0 and the, the year before that he got beat, got beat a heavy number as well. It seems it doesn't seem like it, it's cutthroat. It seems like there's it's a Ralph Halton who is trying to get the lads to get on board with how they're trying to play. And there will be setbacks from time to time, but it seems like a, a really good learning environment. And I think that'd be perfect for somebody like Gavin Bazunu. But I, I think we're going to get on to it later about uh, the strength that we have for the three goalkeepers with Cueve and Kelleher, Gavin Bazunu. It looks like Travers is going to be a premiership number one this season as well. So I think Kelleher could have went from number one to number number three in the space of a couple of weeks, which is it's crazy. And it's just a shame that, we're so strong in the goalkeeping department and, you know, we're a little bit light in other areas. But, yeah, fantastic that we have three super goalkeepers. Yeah, just on that, Lisa, I mean, if you're Cueving Keller and you're, as um, as Keith has said there, you know, Gavin Bazoon is likely to be a uh, Premier League number one, depending on if he beats Alex McCarthy to, um, to get that shirt. And then, obviously, Mark Travers as well at Bournemouth is in with a good shout of being a number one. What would you be doing in Cueving Keller's shoes right now? Would it be kind of looking and pushing for a loan move? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting one. I think, firstly, I think the move for Gavin Bazunu to Southampton is an excellent one because 
I know Southampton is my old club. I played for them a long time ago, but um, I was there not a few years ago, just looking, um, you know, getting to have a look at the club and how they do things and the, the setup and the academy and um, the whole culture around the club. And it really is a culture of development. Um, Southampton know what their identity is. They're not t challenging for titles at the moment, but they are a club that develops players and then looks obviously, and they've brilliant track record of it you look at the players that have come through Southampton and and they they're they're not just good at getting players through from their academy into first team they're also particularly good at picking up young players exposing them to first team football um, and then developing to sell them on um, and that's why I think this move for Gavin is going to be a really really good one because because of that ethos in the club and and as you alluded to, the, the, the pressure is not the same there. You will be exposed to an amount of pressure and it gives you that chance as a young player to adjust to it without feeling the full wrath of it when it comes, when you go to, to one of the clubs that is expected to challenge for trophies and, and, and for titles. But um, on the Cuevin Kelleher one, I think um, Stephen Kenny's comments in the last couple of days are quite interesting where he has made it clear that he wants players and will choose players who are playing for their clubs. And I think that's him putting the gauntlet down a little bit to players that, that you know, in order to play for the senior team, because if the if players are not playing for the playing for their clubs, it does affect the the, the quality and, and the I suppose the consistency in the senior team's ability to deliver performances and results. Um, and, and Stephen does bear that the brunt of that pressure. So um I think it's interesting, but I think it's such a difficult dynamic when you think about um, a number one and a number two goalkeeper. The number two, once the number two is assigned, that's it. The, the, the number one is the number one. And you saw it, you saw it with Chelsea. It was really interesting during the Club World Cup. Um, Kepa played the semi-final of the FIFA Club World Cup for Chelsea. And he had a brilliant game, made two crucial saves um, for them to progress into the final. Mendy wasn't in the squad for the semi-final. He was with Senegal and won the AFCON. He came back in for the final. Instead of going and having a little break, he came back in and he went straight back into the team and they won the Club World Cup because the business at that level is to win trophies. And if you're the number one, you're the number one. If you're the number two, you're the number two. And you almost have to accept that. And I think at clubs, big clubs need a really, really strong number two. But it's a massive sacrifice for a player who could be a number one to settle for being a number two. I think you can do it earlier in your career, but as you, it does come a point when you have to do it. But for Cuevin Kelleher, because of the competition that exists for Ireland, and he's, I, he doesn't strike me as a type of player who wants to settle for being a number two. It's a big decision. So... And Liverpool, will Liverpool want him to stay as a number two? Of course they will. But is that the right thing for Cuevin Keller? The right thing for Liverpool might not be the best thing for Cuevin Kelleher. And these are the decisions that a player has to make throughout their career. Um, and they are ultimate, they can be decisions that can define. Like you look at Gavin, he went to Portsmouth and um, I think he had a spell at Rochdale as well. Tough places to go, hard leagues to play in. Um, and you learn, you learn a lot in those leagues um, and it stands to you and you can see it stands to Gavin. Um, but it's an interesting one for Cuevin. I think he has got big decisions to make and it will come down to whether he thinks he will learn more as a number two at Liverpool or if he goes out on loan. And ultimately that will be, be a decision he has to make. Yeah, Lisa, just talking about Cuevy, if you go back to last year, he started every game in the Carabao Cup, starred in the final, scored the penalty kick that won the tournament for Liverpool. In the FA Cup, I think he played the third and the fourth rounds, but Alisson then came back in for the business end and Liverpool went on to win the FA Cup. So it, it just, the point you made there about goalkeepers, your number one keeper is there at the business end to win the trophy. Yeah. Somebody asked me yesterday, like, what club or where would you see Cuevin going to? Is he a bottom? Is he a bottom end of the Premier League or Championship? Where would like? Is he? Is he? Is he? I I think he's a player that could fit into a Premiership club. No, 
But where would you like to see it? Would, would, would you think maybe top end championship or a club like me? He'd hardly go to, to Everton or somewhere like that because there's talk about maybe Pickford leaving. So where would you see, like, where would you see him or could see him going? Or it's it- really difficult to know because I think for a goalkeeper like Cleveland Kelleher, the way he plays. So, you know, he is, a, and, you know, I know we've, we've mentioned it already about, and, and Keith has mentioned it as well about play goalkeepers are much more complete nowadays. They're, they're your goalkeeper, but they're also your first attacker at the minute the ball transitions into their hands and they have it They're in, They're the ones that are initiating the play. So I think, you know, the, 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 the style of play and the philosophy uh, of the club and the identity of the club and the way they play would would and should have a huge factor in any decision that Creveen would make because it has to develop him as a goalkeeper um, for the attributes that he needs to develop. Um, and that is playing against playing out from the back against teams that are going to press you, learning to deal with that, you know, being able to use both feet for those distributions, mixing up your distributions, being able to spot where the space is to play to and the execution of accurate um, initiations of play. And I think, you know, that's why it's, People will speculate about a club, but I think it's not just about getting the move. It's about getting a move to a club where you will play in the way that develops you in line with your strengths. Um, So I think it it is. um, And if you're going to go on loan, you need to know you're going to be the number one. You Mm -hmm. need to know that you're going to play. So. I think there's a lot of factors in it. Um, and I, I think it's hard to just pick a club out of the sky and say yeah. they'd be a great fit for him because there's so many different dynamics that um, come with it. But really, if a player like Cuevin is going to go and look to go for on loan, he needs to go to a club that matches up in terms of in the style of play to the way he needs to develop as a goalkeeper. But also he needs to know that he's going to play and be the number one there. Yeah. Yeah, and a final one on the transfer front. And Keith, this involves actually two of your former clubs, Burnley and Blackburn. So from the Blackburn point of view, of course, uh, Dara Lenehan has finished up there after at least a decade at the club. And I think Middlesbrough seems to be the destination that's been talked about. On the other side, something we talked about last week, which was Nathan Collins, who got relegated with Burnley, but it feels like his level is much higher than that. And there are loads of clubs linked with them, whether it's Wolves, Leeds, Aston Villa and Leicester. Whether a move is realistic um, or not, again, it depends on Burnley's finances and the fee they set. But uh, first on Collins, uh, what would you like to see happen this summer? Because it feels maybe a year in the championship, not necessarily, it wouldn't be wasted exactly. Burnley are a big club, but you feel that for him to ve- develop and continue where he's at, he needs to be at the highest level possible. Yeah, uh, personally, looking at me old club, Burnley, they brought in Vincent Company. I believe they're going to try and start playing a bit of football, obviously coming over from Belgium. That's, that's in Vincent Company's DNA. Whether that will help Nathan Collins, you know, I've played a tough more for a couple of years. It's not the most inviting of places to try and play football, even when you're the home team. I remember once uh, drawing a nil all a half time against Yeovil and the crowd booing. And we were trying to play football under Eddie Howe, trying to do it the right way, but the crowd were coming in on top of us and we ended up going a little bit more direct and, and getting the win. And I don't know, I just don't see Bournemouth. You know, obviously, I have great respect for Vincent Company, what he's done as a player, what he's done over in Belgium as a coach as well. But you're dropping a man who, who has played in the Premiership and you're dropping him into the Championship, which is a very, very unique league. It's a very difficult league to try and negotiate your way out of. So personally, if I'm Nathan Collins, I do think he can play in the Premiership. I'd like to see him make a move, whether it's one of the one of the teams coming up, a Fulham, a Forest, somebody like that. I'd like to see him move. I think... I watched the, the four games with Ireland closely and barring probably 10, 15 minutes against Armenia in the first, the first 10, 15 minutes against Armenia, he, he had a couple of dodgy passes, get the ball away. But take, put that to one side, he, he was outstanding. For the rest, he really was. And when the when he get the ball away the first time and then the second time, I was thinking, God, is he going to go under here? Because international football, it's really, really tough. No matter how many times you played in the Premiership, it's a new team, it's a new, a new system, a new way of playing. And he did, he stood up to it well, he stood up to it really well. And then obviously you want to move on to the, the goal he scored against Ukraine. That's not what he gets paid for, but if we have a centre-half who can step in and do things like that. I, I think I heard a commentator actually say he was like a young John Barnes as he ran through the middle. So 
And we've uh, have Irish and the house being called young John Barnes, and we're, we're, we're really, really happy. But I, I'd be with you, Raf. I think he can play. I think he can play uh, in the Premiership, whether or not you know Barney's finances will have a lot to do with it. I believe they uh, when ALK took over, they loaded them with I think it's nearly two hundred million worth of debt, and they have to pay sixty million up front of it now that they've been relegated. So. I think there will be a big overhaul of players. I think they'll try and cash in on as many players as they can, which obviously, again, will leave them a little bit on the with their bare bones going into the championship. And I don't know, I, to be honest with you, I just don't, I don't see Bournley bouncing back. And if they do bounce back, I don't see them doing it in style. Uh, in style, I mean, playing football the right way and not the way that Stephen Kenny would do it. So if they do come back, I think it'll be a bit of crash bang wallop and get the ball forward, which is going to be a contrast to what which way we want them to play for Ireland. So I don't know. Look at him and his agent will obviously be speaking. They'll they'll have a chat. There'll be there'll be names coming through when he'll either say yes or no straight away to the, to the clubs. But if he can get into the Premiership, I'd lo- I'd love to see him there because I think he's more than capable to stay at that level. Yeah, and Lenehan then gave a good account of himself against Ukraine. Um... As I said, long time at Blackburn, obviously a uh, alumni of uh, Belvedere as a young player as well. Um, Middlesbrough, you know, people might look at it as a kind of sideways step, but you always get a sense that Middlesbrough have a bit more about them in terms of possibly going up than maybe Blackburn would be at the moment. Yeah, and look, he started Lennon in 41 games in the championship. That's a, it's a big bulk of games as well. So he's reliable, very rarely injured, a fit boy. And I've heard I've heard West Brown West Brom thrown around a bit as well with Steve Bruce trying to maybe take Darren Lennon. And he's a free agent, so that will obviously there's no fee involved. So I think a, a few clubs would be more interested than he would have been had there been a fee. So you know, West Brom and Middlesbrough are probably the two front runners that I'm hearing. Chris Wilder or Steve Bruce. I think if we're looking at it from an Irish point of view, again, we'd like to see him go with Chris Wilder, a bit more football, maybe would be played rather than Steve Bruce style of football. So look, he he, all, all his options are open. He played really, really well for Ireland against the Republic. And when you when you look at who we had missing with Duffy, Coleman, Doherty, I thought we'd struggle in that game. I really did. And the likes of Collins and Lennon really, really stood up and were counted. So, but yeah, look, if it, if it was a straight shootout between West Brom and Middlesbrough, I'd rather see him go to Middlesbrough just because of the style of play. I, I feel it with Fordwich game a bit more than... I think it's Darrell Lennon. If he keeps his head down, although it, it maybe is a sideways move, championship to championship... I don't think it'll be long before we do see him in the in the Premiership. It's very good left foot, and it's very rare you get a, a defender who can use his left foot. Let me tell you, it's they usually just for standing on, but he's more than capable of using it. Yeah, for yeah, indeed. I don't have a left foot at all. Not I'm not left-handed either. Apart from what the one time I broke my wrist, where I was uh, left for about six weeks having to use uh, this one, and it was an absolute disaster. But anyway, um, uh, as we said, Lisa, we were going to talk about the Ireland women's team who've got a crucial qualifier in Georgia on Monday and the way the group is at the moment they're third but with a game in hand on Finland and two on Sweden realistically it's the second playoff spot that they're looking for this is a team that they've beaten 11-0 in Tala just uh, towards the end of last year so it's a very very different challenge from the very impressive performance against Sweden in April. Yeah and I think you know to put some context around the result in in Dublin whilst it was um, I think the biggest win for an Ireland women's team in history, um, the 11 win, 11 nil win, and it will help massively with if if goal difference becomes a deciding factor in the group. But I think it, we have to bear in mind that Georgia ha- had a lot of COVID issues at the time, um, and it wasn't their full strength squad. They were missing a number of key players. Um, and also, I think they had some players in the camp who had just recently recovered from it. So, and if you look at the results that teams have had when they travelled to Georgia in the other teams in the group, they weren't big score lines. So, I think they're a team that travel or that doesn't travel particularly well, um, but that at home it's a very difficult place to play, and and they make it as difficult as possible. And I think that's what we'll probably expect to see. And also, the heat being a factor. For Ireland, I was looking at the temperatures there and it, it looks like it's going to be 31, 32 degrees. Um, you know, it's a, it's an early enough kickoff. It's early in the day. So obviously Ireland are over training in Turkey at the moment to acclimatise. They're friendly against Philippines this week um, to help that process and just to get the players used to. And Keith will know this when you play in those types of temperatures. It's hard even just to breathe 
and get the air into your lungs and get your second wind early in the game. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's by chance the timing of this game. So I think, um, look, Ireland, it, but, but having said all that, this is still a, a game that we would expect Ireland to win. I think the quality in the team, Lily Ag has come in and she made her debut. Um, she's a player I had at London City Lionesses. I remember her when she heard that um, Hayley Nolan and Ali Murphy had been called up. She was in knocking on my door going, did you know I've got family in Cork? <laughs> and I was like, well, no, I didn't, but I will let Vera know. So, and look, to be fair to Lily, she had um, some, you know, she had some se fairly severe injury issues to come through, got through them, got, got herself back playing. And I told her, look, Vera's watching you. Um, and um, so she had a great incentive but um, it was lovely. Actually, I was talking to her the other day and she said, you know, it was a big moment for her mom and her granddad. I think there was a few tears in, in, in the house when she made her debut and, and scored. So listen, Lily is the type. She's a creative midfielder. She's quite abrasive. Um, she takes no prisoners. She will get around the pitch. So I think she's a great addition to the squad. Um, and you, you look at the likes of Jessie Stapleton coming in as well and getting her um, for senior cap and you know just it, it's really good to see the the player the young players coming through but look in terms of the nuts and bolts this is a, a game where Ireland are going to be facing a team that's going to play in a low block they're going to need creative players on the pitch they're going to have to be patient learn to weather the weather um, and and just take the opportunities when they come because the lo it, it, it's the type of game the longer it goes on the more difficult it can become. But I think, you know, the squad is fresh. Um, they're out of season. They're almost doing a bit of a pre-season over in Turkey at the moment. So they're finding their rhythm. And, um, you know, I think, look, if Ireland could get an early goal, it can it can be great. But I think it might be a game for a bit of patience and, and even a game where if we struggle to break them down, that, you know, the bench could be really important in it. Yeah, um, Stephanie Roach, as I think was probably mm -hmm. the uh, you know the big the big name in terms of kind of returning to the squad. Um, you know, it kind of felt for a long time she was out of the picture. Like, were you surprised when you heard her name being called? Despite the fact she's been in brilliant form for P Mount, and what kind of impact do you think she will have, um, or whether she will feature or not? Yeah, I think look, Steph has had um, a, a great season so far with um, P Mount, and, and look, to be fair to her, she's always said it. You know, she was still available for selection, but she need, she knew she needed to focus on playing as many games as she could for P-Mount and, and scoring goals. And that's what she's done. And she's been scoring some fabulous goals. Um, and, and look, she just needed to be patient and wait for her time. And, and she's done that and she deserves to be there now. So, look, it's a great opportunity for her. I, I don't know if she'll start. Um, it depends really on how Vera sees the game and what way she feels that she needs um, how they're going to look to, to break it down because Ireland are normally a team that sit back and, and you know, sit into, a, you know, the middle part of the pitch, even drop lower if they have to try to win the ball back and then counter attack. And, you know, yes, there'll be opportunities probably to do that um, against Georgia, but I think the onus will be more on Ireland to build play and, and break them down so um but I do think Steph could have a real role in this game whether she starts or whether she comes on as a sub Steph has that capacity to score from range and to score from anywhere and she does see it so um you know I think um it'll be interesting but you know and the fact that she got some game time um against Philippines is probably a good sign for her um it means that she's very much probably in Vera's thoughts but um, but again, she just needs to keep the head down and keep doing what she's doing. And if she gets an opportunity, I'm sure she'll she'll do everything ca she can to make the most of it. Yeah, and from Vera Powell's point of view, in terms of the message that sends, you know, when there's a player maybe who's been sort of on the fringes or even outside of the fringes and they've been brought back in, and the, maybe the message that sends to other players who are in a similar position, um, like what what do you think that actually does send to that kind of wider national pool? Well, I think you know, in fairness to Vera, she's never you know not picked players you know based on which leagues they were in or you know you didn't have to be in England to be in the squad there's always been a good mix of players from the women's national league and I think you know she's to be fair to her she's pretty much gone with the squad that she believes will will win the game um and you can't fault that and sometimes players are in form and sometimes they're not and you know sometimes I think it can be difficult to not to 
not show loyalty to a player who's been there for a long time, but is coming to a point in their career or when they hit a patch where they're not in form. Um, and it can be very difficult to say no to a player. You're not in this time. But Vera's never had a problem doing that. Um, and I think it's a strength. Because I think, you know, in order to qualify, you need to just pick the best players that are available for, to win that game. You get that game done and dusted, you win the game and you move on to the next one. Because in international football, you just don't know. You can have the best plans in the world. And then, you know, on the, on the, you know when the games are finished and you, you're calling up your squad and people, you know, you could be missing two or three players, key players that just don't report into the hotel and you have to change a lot of things. And that's the nature of international football, particularly when you don't have the depth of the bigger nations. It can be a real difficulty. But um, but I think Vera has, you know, always picked the, the squad that she believes is the, are the players in form or the players, young players that are shown potential. You look at Jamie Finn, she had no problem putting Jamie Finn into big games last year, the big friendly against Belgium, I think it was, put her into midfield. And she had, you know, she was up against, uh, and Denmark, I think she played against Pernilla Harder. Like, Pernilla Harder is one of the best players in the world and Vera had no problem putting her in there. So um, I think... I think to be fair to her, I think she just picked the squad that she thinks the players, these are the players that are in form. And, um, and, and yeah, and I think it does send out a good message because it also means that if you're not in form, it doesn't mean you're out. Um, and we've seen that with some players like Lily Ag was in the squad initially, had her injury and now she's back in. Um, you had Claire Shine who was in the squad, was out of the squad for a while and got back in. So, you know, that's what you want to see is you want to see that your current form or the work that you're doing in order to get back in gets rewarded. And I think we see that. Yeah, Lisa, as well, we were talking about goalkeepers there in relation to the men's game. Uh, I think we're fairly well served between the posts in Courtney Brosnan. She did have a bit of a horror show in the previous campaign in one game, but I, I thought she was really stellar in her performance against Sweden over in Gothenburg. Yeah, and look, <laughs> the goalkeeping position is such a thankless position. Um, and Courtney, to be fair to her, some of her mistakes were costly. Um, but she had she she would go from you know having a one big mistake and it's such an unforgiving position because you make one mistake there's no coming back from it it'll cost a goal um, but what I admired most about Courtney was her resilience and her ability to consistently put those mistakes behind her and keep going and not let it get into her head and. Goalkeepers are real confidence players. If, if, if they do not have the capacity to manage their own mindset and deal with mistakes, big mistakes in games and have that resilience and that ability to come back, then it can be very difficult for them. But Courtney never flinched. She just kept going. She kept training. She kept working. And she turned in man of the or player of the match performances consistently in this in this campaign um you know she got one and probably deserved it in the next game but didn't get it just because she had got it in the the game previous mm -hmm. um but but that's what i like about her is is that resilience and i think when you experience stuff like that it gives you a bit of depth to your character and your ability in a game um and you can't buy that experience you have to get it and there's only one way to get it, and that's the hard way. And she's got that, and she's got it in spades, and she's able to deal with the pressure. So I think those errors, um, whilst they were difficult at the time for her to deal with and for the team to deal with, I think they really stand to her now and probably are really standing to Ireland in this campaign. And also the fact that the manager and the, the goalkeeping coach and the backroom team consistently put her back in and said, we still believe in you. We know you have what it takes and we we back you and you're our number one which is really where she is at the moment yeah yeah i suppose a final point uh, before we move on to the league of ireland um you know we were talking about patience and trying to break down a, a team in uh, uh, tough conditions and then uh, it could be helpful if denise sullivan repeats the goal she scored against houston there <laughs> <laughs> at the weekend as well uh, after, like um i think we're, obviously with rights restrictions and things we can't play um, it here so can you um just describe that for us lisa Oh, it's just pure Denise O'Sullivan, isn't it? Like there's only there's a certain number of players that just have what it takes to go and do that. And I mean, just the way she caught it, like the way she hit it, 
and I had some distance to travel and there really wasn't a whole lot of space for it to go. But I love when you when they catch them like that and the ball doesn't even turn in the air. It just it goes like almost, you know, like an arrow. Um, but it was such a sweet strike. And that's again, you know, we're so fortunate to have a player of Denise's quality, um, both in and out of possession. What she brings to the team is phenomenal. Um, and like I said, when you have a player on the pitch that can just do that, um, it's so important. Um, and and look, to be fair to her, she probably do a goal like that for Ireland. <laughs> and it'd be great if we could see one in, in one of the next three games. But look, Denise is a, a top quality player. She's playing at the highest level of the game in the States. Um, and, you know, I think even... For the other players, when they see one of their own doing something like that, it gives them all a lift. You know, it's it's something that everyone can just sit back and, and enjoy. And, um, you know, hopefully we see a few more from her in, in, in a green shirt. It'd be great. Most certainly. And also in the SSE or Tristy League Premier Division, there was also a cracking goal from Dawson Devoy as Bohemians beat Shelburne uh, 1-0. And um, they were also down to 10 men, of course, as well, uh, later on in the second half. And then Derry City drew 1-1 with Drada United. Dundalk in the big game on Friday beat Shamrock Rovers 1-0 Robbie Benson scoring with 10 minutes to go and then St. Pat's and Keith you uh, mentioned off air you were at or you were doing commentary on this one St. Pat's beat UCD 2-1 with Owen Doyle scoring twice and then Sligo Rovers John Russell's first game in charge 3-0 win over Finn Harps with Aidan Keena scoring a couple of goals we'll start with uh, Dundalk obviously look their third clean sheet in a row um, since beating Derry City 2-1 second best defensive record uh, behind Shamrock Rovers, only conceded 14 to Rovers is 13. So, uh, Keith, I suppose overall, you know, we've been talking about Dundalk for a while over the last last few weeks in terms of their form under Stephen O'Donnell, going from, you know, getting too many draws at the start of the season and now really kind of uh, setting their stall out. And we almost have a title race. Yeah, we do. They're, what is it, five points behind uh, Rovers now and they have a game in hand as well. So it, the race really is on. And to be fair, you look back, what, couple of weeks ago when you're thinking there's not going to be a race Rovers are going to run away with it again but it's great that we do have a we do have a race and fair play to Nandaka and Stephen O'Donnell because I done a I done a, a podcast uh, a, a year or so ago or, sorry it would have been just as, as he left uh, St. Pat's and he was getting a bit of bit of aggro from the, the 200 people that were there saying oh, it's a sideways move I can't believe it it was actually viewed as a backwards move as well at the time because People were expecting Pats to kick on and Dundalk to tail off ever so slightly, but he's really has. He just as Dundalk looked like they were coming away, he's really uh, injected a bit of impetus again. Five wins on the bounce, don't concede an awful lot of an awful lot of goals, and they look really really solid as well. And going and beating Rovers, Robbie Benson with the goal as well. They look like it, they could put this into a real race, and with the fixtures coming up on the weekend, just makes it uh, makes it really really. It makes a mouth water and it's good because, like we said, Raph, we I really didn't think we were going to get a title race, but it looks like we're going to get a get a half decent one anyway. Yeah, they're uh, five points behind, game in hand, and also they don't have Europe to contend with. Yeah, well, that's it. So the, the legs will be a little bit uh, a little bit better off than than the Rovers players, but Rovers have such a big squad that I wouldn't exactly hold that against them. Saying so I think that they could fall off at this point. At that point, they've such a big squad, they can mix it up and down. And, yeah, look, I, I, I just hope Dundalk keep it up and, and just put uh, put Rovers under a bit of pressure. Like we say, getting into the last couple of weeks of the season, we still have a race going on. Yeah, because Shamrock Rovers, of course, Lisa, um, they go from that Dundalk game now to a what is always going to be a tricky derby against Bohemians, albeit they've beaten Bowles the last <laughs> couple of times. Um, so they have the edge on that front. But um, it's a it's a tough it's a tough game, albeit it's in Tala as well. Yeah, look, those games always take on you know their own nature and and they are brilliant games they're games that every league of ireland fan kind of looks forward to you know whether you're you know involved with the clubs or not like is it's always a result that you want to watch and and see what happens but um but no look i think that it it's interesting for rovers you know the fact that they pulled away so much and then you know slowly it's been reined back in and you know it is a challenge for them and and you know Everyone was, and myself included, was talking about Derry City more so than we were talking about anybody else, really, as as potential contenders to Dundalk or, or to Shamrock Rovers. And Dundalk, that I think that went in their favour. You know, they were just quietly in the background. I, I know I covered a couple of their games 
early on in the season, um, particularly their one against Drogheda, where they just really struggled to keep the ball, to keep possession. Um, they, as you said, they were drawn a lot of games, um, keeping clean sheets, but not able to score. But they're starting to find a bit of um, a rhythm in the team now. And, you know, you can see the, I suppose, the older Dundalk traits that I would remember in that team from Cork City times. Um, you can see them starting to creep back in and you know or become a bit more evident and you know Dundalk will enjoy the fact and Stephen O'Donnell will enjoy the fact that no one's really talking about them and that they're just there in the background doing their business creeping up the table and that's all they can do just keep putting points on the board um you know and it's if you if clean sheets win leagues goals win games but clean sheets win leagues um and, and that's they're doing you know that's been a, a real feature of the team so um but look the dublin derby is is a game that can take on look anything can happen in them we've seen it down through the years um, and obviously with Andy Lyons going from Bowes to Rovers and he's been having a cracking season himself and I think he he had um, an important role in the last one. So, um, you know, look, I think it's it's a great game, big pressure game for, for Rovers. One, they have to win. Um, no, no, not as much pressure on Bowes, obviously, but um, with Dundalk so hot on their heels, I think, you know, there is a little bit of pressure there for Rovers and, you know, they don't have the, the little bit of comfort zone that they, they had a few weeks ago. So they, they have to keep winning. Yeah. And I was listening to Stephen McPhail afterwards, uh, after the defeat to Dundalk. And it was the same sort of messaging that Stephen Bradley puts out, which is, look, we're fine. You know, it's a defeat, but like there's good things from the performances. So they I, I get the general sense from them, Keith, that um, they would. Well, they're more than likely, look, as you said, they have the strongest squad of any team in the league and they're more than likely to go on and you know go on and win it uh, regardless of what Dundalk and Derry City do but they have this thing of at least in speaking to the public and to the media specifically that they play the defeats down as the, in the same way that they play the wins down as well so that there seems to be a kind of even keel there. Yeah, I think there has to be. You have to be on the on the same wavelength, the manager and, and the assistant manager when you talk to the media because you get mixed messages that it will quickly transpired into the dressing room and your nerves start coming. But I think there's a lot of there's a lot of older heads. There's a couple of younger heads in the Shamrock Rovers Rovers dressing room. I don't think they'll be faced by by losing. I know it, it it's a loss. They they wouldn't have wanted to, to lose to Dundalk, but they're still five points ahead. I know Dundalk have a game in hand, but they'll be saying we're five points ahead. We're into the, the second half of the league now. If we can keep doing what we do and just keep uh, keep Dundalk at arm's length and you know, I have to say, I was really disappointed with Derry as well with with the 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 finances that's gone in there at the start of the year. I expected them to to be there or thereabouts. I know they're toured, but the run they're on at the minute hasn't really been great. And I think Dundalk have obviously took uh, done really well to take them over. And I, I don't think Shamrock Rovers will panic whatsoever. Like I say, they're they're experienced bunch in there. They're ahead at the minute, and they'll just keep uh, they'll just keep them dark at arm's length. But like we say, we hope there's another slip up there for Rovers at some point from a neutral's point of view that we get a race from a, a, a proper title race the whole way in. Yeah, and from a Bulls point of view, as I said, they beat Shelburne one 0 and good goal from Dawson Devoy. Um, the problem for them though, and Keith Long has said it, I think pretty much every second week I hear him, you know, when he's talking, when he's talking to whoever it is, Adrian Eames or whoever post-match is they seem to put in one kind of good performance or one good half and they can never seem to be able to follow it up. And you would worry maybe coming in and obviously look, there's the motivation of a derby. So you can maybe take that aside, but you know, the, the fact that they've got a good win against shells doesn't in their case necessarily mean they're going to be able to follow that up based on uh, what we've seen over the season. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I listened to Keith Long myself, Raf, and, and the things he's saying is I think he's trying to put together a 90 minute performance, which is a very difficult thing to do as, as a coach and manager, or even as a player, you will get, 10, 15 minutes in games where you're on top and things feel good and you'll also have 15, 20 minutes of the game where you're, where you're under the cosh and you need to just weather the storm and I think Bowes have been okay when they're on top but when the opposition team have started to go on top they do go wonder and I think that's where Keith Long is a little bit disappointed because they've shown in the games that they're, they're good enough they have enough quality to dominate the game but for whatever reason you know things happening within the game they seem to just drop back and, and invite a little bit of pressure. And Keith Long won't be happy with that. But like you say, it's a derby on the weekend. So you'd expect uh, you'd expect Bowes to be to be full of legs, full of running, full of desire. And 
I do think they'll be on top at some point in the game. It might only be a 10-minute period, a five-minute period they'll be on top in the game. If they can make that, that five or ten minutes count and hit the back of the net and be really, really resilient in the, in the defence, then they do have half a chance. And like Lisa said, we never really know which way these Dublin derbies are going to go. So Bowes will turn up with all the energy and all the ambition in the world. And like I say, we, we hope there's, there's another slip up for, for Rovers as a neutral point of view. Do we see it coming on the weekend? If I'm honest, probably not. But stranger things have happened. Yeah, as Keith said there, um, in regards to Derry City, I mean, it's the run they're on is quite disappointing. And obviously there had been the little break and you would have thought, from a Derry point of view, regroup and then try and like grind out a win. Unfortunately for them, Lisa, they uh, they got pegged back by Dean Williams' penalty uh, for Drada. And again, it's a missed opportunity. And it, the question marks kind of linger then um, for either side of the break. So um, for, for Derry, obviously kind of next up, Next up for them, it's a trip to UCD, which probably offers an opportunity for three points. But it, it just seemed to, it's, it's a struggle for momentum at the moment for them. Yeah, and I think, you know, and, and look, to be fair, it's probably this group at Derry, it's, it, as a group and, and as a management group, it's their first year, really. So, and it does take, I firmly believe it takes a year just to get your, to get your, get what you want into the players, get them to understand it, get them to be able to execute it in games and against different types of opposition. I think the, the bit of pressure probably didn't help them um, because, and with the investment, you know, everyone's going to talk them up and, and look, that's going to be par for the course. And that's something that Rory will, will, will just have to get used to. But I really think, you know, whilst they started well and I thought they probably would have had a bit more consistency than they've shown, I think really Derry will probably, you know, we'll probably see the fruits of their labours next season. I think he will might make a few adjustments to his squad again in the off-season. Um, he might even freshen things up a little during the, the, the summer break. But I think really Derry are grounding now for what they'll do next year. Um, and the, the key is like, look, we know they have the talent. We know they have the capacity. They've probably got some key players that they thought might have been available earlier that, that haven't been. Um, so I think um, for them, this year will be more of an establishment year and we will see a bit more. You know, I think they'll have bigger expectations on them next year. Um, but you know, they do need to find a little bit of rhythm as well. It's important that they do that. Um, and that can be the hardest thing. You know, you win in a game and then getting that consistency and getting that bit of momentum because the momentum, you know, goes the opposite way as well. If you've got negative momentum, it's just as hard to break that. Um, so, and sometimes the summer break does help with that. And sometimes it, it, if you don't get the, the the good start straight after the break, it can just fall back in again so but look um, I'm sure they're working hard on it as you say the UCD game they'll probably see it as an opportunity to go and try and get back to winning ways um, but but for Derry really finding a bit of consistency in their positive and some positive momentum is what they need to establish um, for the second part of the season. Yeah, and Keith, you were at Pats and UCD um, doing commentary and obviously Owen Doyle, who I think there were would have been high hopes for this season in terms of delivering kind of a huge glut of goals, at least on this on this front anyway, he got a brace and he has he has had a few goals over the season anyway. Um, but it's key for them, especially with the young squad around them, that he's able to, you know, kind of deliver on, on that front. Yeah, well, that's exactly what uh, what Pats will want from him. And it, it'll be a little bit a little bit disappointed on Doyle because there was there was a chance in the fourth half. He, he's only about six or seven yards out, and he, he's moving away from the goal. He, he's in front of the goal. He's moving away from the goal, and it's up around hip height. And he, he's trying to he gets good contact on it, but he just hits it wide. And just after that, UCD went up and had a chance, and Agnan actually made two very good saves in the in the Pats goal. And you're just thinking as I'm doing commentary and thinking. Pats have been really, really comfortable in this 45 minutes. Will be They're unlucky not to be a goal up, but there was a scenario where he could have been one nil down at half time. And you're just thinking all the time with Pats, although they look really good in possession, they, they threatened, they were huffing and puffing. They Even when they hit the back of the net, the, the Doyle, uh, Owen Doyle got two. You're still thinking UCD do, do possess a counter punch here. And they brought Liam Kerrigan on in, a, in around the 75th minute. Pat start dropping back. They made a, they went from a four at the back to a five at the back. And all of a sudden, UCD got a goal. I think it was about the 86th minute. 
And you see there throwing the kitchen sink at them. Now, Pat's managed to obviously see the game out and win 2-1. But from a coaching point of view, and even as a player's point of view, you're thinking for 80-odd minutes, Pats were very, very comfortable in this game. And there's a scenario where they could have drew it. So I know Liam Clan- uh, Tim Clancy won't be too happy with that, thinking that being so... like When you look at the game, I was looking at the game and I, I, I analysed the, the stats and... It, it was a real shock to me that UCD actually had 51% of the ball. They had more shots on goal as well. They, so for, they were more productive in the game. Although for me, watching it, Pats were really, really comfortable. And it, when you break it down and you look at the stats, they were actually very contrasting. But like I say, Pats very, very comfortable, but just couldn't put UCD to the sword, just couldn't put them out of the game. And like you said, when they did go and get the get the goal in the 80, 86, 87 minute, you're thinking, oh God, is there a little, little sting in the tail here? And, and that's what Tim won't be happy with, just the fact that they just couldn't put UCD away. And very, very impressed with Liam Kerrigan when he came on, I have to say, I think he's a real good player and no disrespect to UCD, but I'd be surprised if he found himself there next year. Yeah, and for, but from the relegation point of view, obviously UCD made Pats work for that uh, for that result and or for their for their win. Um, obviously they're up against Finn Harps in this battle for automatic relegation. Like, do you give them much chance? And I don't know how much of Finn Harps you've seen, and from the opposite point of view, whether you give them a chance either. Well, if if I'm going Finn Harps or UCD, I would back UCD. But look, it's more of a I just, I just think UCD have a little bit more about them. I think they're a little bit more resilient defensively. They they stay in games for long periods of time like they did against Pats. They've only one win this season. I know that that's not great out of 20 games, but they've six draws, which just goes to show you that they do stick around in games. So, like I said, Pats beat them 2-1, and they'll obviously be disappointed with that. But if I was if I was uh, Andy Moyle, the manager, I'd be having a look and just saying, lads, look, if we if we could have hit the, the big big moments in the game, if we hit the back of the net there, had we uh, had we uh, avoided conceding there, I know that it's all if buts and maybes, but I don't think UCD are a million miles away from it. I think there is a core there if they could just just like I say, big big moments in the game, if they could just come out the right side of them big moments, I think they could be all right. Like I say, Liam Kerrigan. Big, big fan of his. Duffy as well was really good all night, but just need to defend that little bit better and stay in games for longer periods like they have been doing. And if they can hit the back of the net and, like I say, keep other teams out, I feel they'll be all right. But Finn Harps, I've got to be honest, only nine points so far. I, I don't give them much hope. I think I think they'll be uh, returning back down next season. Yeah, and Sligo Rovers beat Finn Harps 3-0. And uh, Jim, obviously you always have the year to the ground um, in oh, Sligo. Yeah. So John Russell's yeah. first game in charge, fairly satisfactory. Yeah, it was. It was a pretty comfortable win. I mean, they had two goals. They went two goals up inside the fit, inside the first seven minutes. The Harps keeper made a bit of a howler, McGinley, for the um, second goal. Yeah, I mean, Sligo were comfortably. They played some decent football uh, were without Greg Bulger on the night. But still, at times, they, they were a bit sloppy and careless at times as well. And Harps did have a couple of chances. Uh, McGinty did have to make a couple of saves, but then, look, Sligo scored again later on. But, um, yeah, look, I mean, it's an important part of the season for Sligo, of course, because they've got that trip to Wales now in the Conference League coming up where they play Bala. And the expectation is that, you know, the expectation is that they'll be expected to win that game. And I believe there's a crowd of 400, 450 people heading over to, uh, I think it's Shropshire. I think the game has been played at the TNS ground, which is Total Network Solutions ground. So um, so Sligo, like, I mean, they'll be in the, look, they'll be looking again at those top four spots, which I think is going to be really, really competitive. I mean, if we're talking about a title race, Shamrock Rovers won, if, if we're saying Dundalk two, I think it's going to be really, really competitive for those other two uh, spots, Possibly at this stage, you're saying two from four with maybe sort of Derry, Pats, Sligo and Bowes in that order. But uh, yeah, it's a crucial period for Sligo coming up. Also, just looking at, at, at the fixtures there with, with Keith mentioned about Shamrock Rovers uh, title, they're away to Pats on Monday. So, I mean, that could be that's that's a crucial test for them as well. So uh, yeah. coming up. Yeah, for, most certainly. And uh, as we talk about title races, um, which may or may not happen in the Premier Division, the First Division, at least for the promotion, direct promotion race, uh, there certainly is a lot going on. So uh, Bray Wanderers lost 5-1 at home to Galway United, who have now gone top of the division. Treaty United beat Athlone Town 2-1. Cove Rambers lost 3-0 to Wexford. And then Cove did part ways with their manager, 
Darren Murphy. And then in the Saturday game, it was um, Longford Town drawing 1-1 with Cork City. And that is the reason why Galway have gone top. So, Lisa, um, you would always have the ear to, gr- ear to the ground in Galway. Obviously, it's a club you know very, very well. And, you know, it's nip and tuck at the very top there. Yeah, it is. It's it's a brilliant, brilliant title race. Um, two really good teams, Cork and Galway, just with so much... Um, bite about them and and you know talent and obviously I know Colin Healy really well from my own time at Cork City and obviously the club and and obviously I was with Galway last year but you know I just feel that you know the hurt from last year was was real um you know to finish second and 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 just lose out in the playoffs it was it was really but I, I feel like with Galway at the moment I just feel like they, they've got real momentum I think you know I think last year when the club changed over and went to full-time football it was, it was a bit like pushing a snowball up a mountain you know just trying to get it going and, and get things to grow and, and develop and get it there and but I just feel in the last few weeks they've maybe got to the top of that mountain and now the snowball is on its way down and it's getting bigger and bigger and faster and tougher and harder every week. Um, and, and I just think, you know, the, there was a real statement about them in, in the win over Bray. Um, I think Cork will push them. Cork City will push them all the way to the end for sure. I think it's going to be a fascinating battle. Um, I think Longford uh, and Waterford can still affect the way the, the, the top two spots up. actually which two teams fall into which order um, but I, I, I just have a feeling and I know it's probably I'm not really biased because I have a lot of bra and a lot of love for both clubs um, but I just feel that Galway have real momentum at the moment and I, I just they're scoring goals there's people all over the pitch contributing to the goals like Walshy is in the form of his life you know going from um uh, I suppose a veteran centre back. I hope he doesn't mind me saying that, or a veteran left back last year to um, a, a centre forward who's got eight goals and four assists this season. He scores after thirty six seconds the other night. You know, Walsh is a brilliant lad. Um, I know he's doing a bit of coaching down there as well. Um, he, he's he's dipped his toe into management himself. So, but um, but look, I just feel that Galway have have real momentum at the moment and and it's it's a momentum that I think is going to be hard to break um and you know look John's a, a seasoned winner he knows what it takes um and um you, you know and there's a really good core of players there like the likes of Connor McCormack um you know some really experienced players Gary Boylan um and and there's a lot of youth there as well like Chief Connor Connor O'Keefe as well um good lads who will keep the group grounded um, but that the, the the momentum will will I think will continue to grow for them, and I, I I wouldn't be surprised if they strengthen a little bit during the window as well. Yeah, and also elsewhere, the men's and women's FAI Cup draws for the open rounds have also been made in the men's uh, in the men's draw. Just the one all Premier Division tie there, Finn Harps against Bohemians, and then the champions said Pats are facing Waterford of the first division. And then in the Women's FEI Cup draw, there's a couple of games involving the uh, teams in the uh, WNL. So uh, fixtures, though, for this weekend that's coming up uh, on Friday, 24th of June. We, as we said, UCD playing against Derry City, Drada United against Sligo Rovers, Shelburne against Dundalk, Shamrock Rovers against Bohemians, which is live on RT2 and the RT player from 7.30, kickoff at 7.45. And then the 8 o'clock kickoff is Finn Harps against against St. Pat's and then elsewhere in the first division that night Cork City against Cove so a Cork derby down there Galway against Treaty United Wexford against Longford Town and then Waterford against Bray Wanderers and that is almost us done but uh, Keith I suppose a final word the transfer window elsewhere um, I know we were kind of focused on um, you know Irish players earlier on but uh, of course Sadio Mane now gone to Bayern Munich from Liverpool and they brought in the likes of Nunes like, what do you make of those moves? I suppose Liverpool did want to keep Mane, but at the same time, everything you know, everything moves on over time. Yeah, it does. I've been thinking about it like before the Champions League final when you're hearing these rumors about Sadio Mane going to Bayern Munich. And I seen a stat on, on Sky the other day saying, I, I think he's his goals alone have, have won Liverpool over 30 points. So you're taking a lot of goals and a lot of points out of the team. And I know Nunes, there's a lot 
being put on his shoulders, people think he, he's going to be brilliant. And I do myself, I've watched a bit of him and he does look like a very, very talented boy. But he hasn't played in the Premiership before. So it is a bit of the unknown. We, we can all assume and think he's going to be brilliant. But is he going to bring the level of appetite that Mane brings? And I think when you bring Mane and Salah together on the wings, you know, f- you know, we, put it as a centre midfielder. If you're Jordan Henderson, all you've got to do is chip a ball 30 yards in behind the defence. And you know, Mane doesn't look at you saying, play it to me feet. He will sprint and make that, that bad ball a good ball, as will Salah. If Nunes buys into that as well, I'm sure he will be a very good player for Liverpool. Whether or not, like Lisa says, it can take a year to hit the ground running. You come in, it's a little bit you're in and out, you don't do well. So Liverpool fans would be desperate for him to hit the ground running. Do I think he will? Do I, I, I think Liverpool at the minute, with Man City obviously signing Haaland as well, I think City have gone a little bit ahead of Liverpool again with the signings they made. And I think losing Mane has weakened Liverpool, even with the signing of Nunes, if, if I'm honest. But I expect it to be a really good title race again. I think Liverpool and City, you can't disregard them. Chelsea, we're not really sure what we're going to get with them. But yeah, I think, it, again, it'll be a two-horse race, but at least it'll be a race between uh, Liverpool and City anyway. Yeah, and Jim, I suppose, um, Darwin Nunes, um, given his first name is Darwin, it is all about evolution. And I think I, I'll take my coat and head off after that. <laughs> It is all about evolution, yeah, uh, yeah, and hopefully, yeah, evolution, revolution, and all kinds of illusions, yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, I, I think also, I think Liverpool, I think Minamino is on his way to Monaco. He's he's uh, another player that's leaving. Also, as well, I think Sliger Rovers just uh, go back there. I just saw they're floating around on the wires just briefly. There, Sliger Rovers have signed an Estonian international midfielder, Frank Livak, this morning to add to. to both to their midfield as well. So that's just fresh off the wires. Yeah. Now the fact that I'm kind of making evolution jokes and Darwin or whatever, I think that is definitely the time to cut it now. So Keith and Lisa, yeah. thanks a million for coming nice. on and uh, subjecting yourself to my terrible humour as well. And uh, Jim, look, uh, no worries. Enjoy, no worries. enjoy yourself on the radio later on. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Talk to you folks. <laughs>